Python's standard library is crazy powerful. Most people know about JSON or OS, but there are modules that can save you hours of work and you're probably not using them. Today, I'll show you 10 powerful standard modules you should absolutely know about. Before I start, if you want to learn more about how to design a piece of software from scratch, I have a free guide for you. You can get it at iron.gold slash design guide. This contains the seven steps I take when I design new software, and hopefully it helps you avoid some of the mistakes I made in the past. The link is also in the video description. The first module I want to talk about is data classes. Now you are probably already using data classes, but I still think it deserves a mention on this list. You might also say, hey, didn't you do a video a couple of weeks ago where you said you were no longer using data class, so what is this all about? Well, it's not that I'm no longer using data classes. I actually still use them, but I don't use them in production systems as much because then I notice that I often end up using things like Pydantic or whatever ships with the specific framework or library I'm working with. Now, data class themselves are still quite helpful to me. I really use them quite often for quickly coming up with some ideas in my Python script, creating a few classes that store a bit of data, making some relationships and seeing how everything fits together. And for me, data class work really well for that because they're just so easy to use. You see an example of how they work. So you simply import the data class decorator from data classes. You put that on top of your class and then you specify the attributes of the class by using type annotations. You can do default values like this, which is really helpful. And there's a ton of other things as well. For example, you can also make a data class frozen. And that way, if you do that and actually type Booleans correctly, then you can also make read only data class, read only objects, which is quite nice as well. Also data classes add a bunch of default behavior. For example, in this case, as you can see, there's no need for initializer, but we still have one where we can pass the arguments uh, as we want. Uh, there is a, a wrapper, so if you print a, in this case, an instance of that data class, it's going to give us something useful instead of just the memory address. So overall data classes are really helpful for that. Here you see what we get as a result when I run this little piece of code. The second library that I think more people should use is pathlib, which basically supplies a modern way of dealing with file path. It replaces os.path with an object-oriented approach to file path. And the nice thing about pathlib is that you can use the slash operator to construct more complex paths. So in this case, I have my base, which is the my project folder, that's a path object. And then I can use slash to create subfolders and then print that. So when I run this, as you can see, we get this. And now this is also a path object. So it's really intuitive to use it. And they have a bunch of helpful methods. For example, you can check if a file exists and then you can print the file size. Uh, you can also create a directory, a parent directory, then write some text to a particular file. So as you can see, now that I run this code, uh, here we have now my project and there is config slash settings dot Tomol, and that's exactly what we wrote here in the code. So now, because it exists, it's also going to print the file size when I run this for a second time. So Pathlib is incredibly helpful. It also works consistently across different operating systems. Third module I want to show you is Functools. This contains powerful decorators and utilities for functional programming. Here you see a couple of examples. I've written a simple power function that takes a base and an exponent, and then it computes the power. That's very basic, obviously. But the nice thing is that we use the cache decorator so that this computation only happens once for each combination of input parameters. So in this case, what you can do is I create a bunch of powers, but when I call this one again, two to the 10, then it's not going to actually compute this, it's just going to directly return the value. So for uh, systems where you need to compute things that are CPU intensive, and you don't want to do double duplicate work, then caching is actually really helpful. And it's really easy to use. When I run this, you see that it computes two to the 10, three to the five, but then here it simply uses the cached result. So that's a really nice feature of functionals. Second thing that I also use quite often is partial function application. And this allows you to take a function like power, for example, 
and already apply some of the arguments. So in this case, I'm doing that for the exponent two and for exponent three. And the nice thing about partial function application is that it doesn't call the function, it creates a new function with that argument already applied. So now we have a square function, and that is actually a function with one argument, the base, and the exponent is set to two. And we also have the cube function. And now we can simply call this with that one argument, and then it's going to use these values which are already applied. And since there is also cache, that still works as expected. And you can also see that here in the output. Functools has a couple of other useful tools as well, by the way. There's LRU cache, which is similar to cache, but has limited memory usage. But there's a reduce function to apply a function cumulatively to a sequence, and there's other things as well. Functools, really nice, try it. The fourth package that I want to mention is Tomolib, and this is included in the standard library since Python 3.11. This allows you to parse Toml files without having to install a third-party package. Here's an example. So I have my PyProject file, and I'm opening that here, and then I do tomolib.load, and then it's going to give me a dictionary with the data in pyproject.toml. Now, in my Tomo file right here, there's not much here. There's a project with a name and a version and a description, etc. But in my example, I can simply access this through the data dictionary. And when I run this, then this is what we get. Standard, what is that? Well, actually, that's the name of the project, as you can see right here. I can simply change this to something else, and then it's going to print that. So Tomo is really helpful, and it's actually quite useful to have a library for that in Python because Toml is kind of the standard for configs in Python projects nowadays. The next module I want to mention is Graphlib, and this helps you sort things based on dependencies. Graphlib has some useful classes as well, such as the topological sorter that helps you sort things based on dependencies. For example, here I'm creating a topological sorter of strings. And then I'm going to add tasks and dependencies. So I've compiled, but I can only compile if I fetched the sources. Test is dependent on compile. Package is dependent on test. Deploy is dependent on package, and, and et cetera, et cetera. I'd simply add these things, and then I can create a static order and then print that as a list. When I run this, then this is what we get. So as you can see, I first need to fetch the sources and then I can compile, etc., etc. So this is really helpful if you're using Python to, I don't know, create a build system or trying to resolve some dependencies in a project and basically any scenario where you need to follow steps in the right sequence. Related to that, there's another module that you might find helpful, which is HeapQ. And this is a dynamic priority queue built on the heap, thus heap queue. And what this does is that it keeps the smallest element always at the front, even when you add tasks dynamically. Here's an example of how this works. So I have three tasks, sending an email to clients, writing documentation, and fixing a critical bug. And these are simple uh, tuples with an uh, integer and a string. Then I can use heapify, it's like Spotify, but for heaps, I can heapify tasks and then I can process them. So I'm popping a priority and a task from the task list in while loop, and then I'm processing that task. And as you can see in the code, I can actually dynamically add tasks. So here, if the task is fixing critical bug, then I'm printing that there is a new urgent task that has arrived, namely deploying a hotfix, and that has priority zero. And if we do that, then actually, uh, the rest of the task, writing documentations and email, is going to be done after we deploy the hotfix, because this has higher priority. If the task is writing documentation, I'm adding another task called refactor old module. But that actually has a lower priority, so that will be done after we send an email to the client. So when I run this, this is also exactly what you see. So we start by fixing the critical work, priority one. Then I get a new urgent task deploying the hotfix. Then we're processing that. Then we're doing a documentation writing, which has priority two. Uh, that adds a task refactoring an old module, which is priority four. But first, we send the email to the client. 
So this is helpful because with HeapQ you don't have to sort manually or scan a list yourselves. It keeps everything in a priority order very efficiently. Module seven is secrets, which are cryptographically secure random numbers. Secrets provides safer random values for things like tokens, passwords, security keys, and the source. So this is how it works. Simply import a module, have a main function, and then it has a bunch of functions like a token hex, for example, which is a secure hex token, or a URL safe token that you can put in a URL, or just some random bytes, or randomly choose an item from a sequence. So there are several options here. And when we run this, then this is what we get. As you can see, the random choice was Apple. Well, I would never have guessed that, so it's completely secure. Basically, the idea is that this doesn't just directly rely on some sort of uh, C table or something. So it's a bit harder to predict what is actually going to be the choice. For example, if you're randomly picking a recovery question answer or password element, then random.choice could be predictable, but secrets.choice is not. Next module is Schutel. Is that how we say it? I'm, I'm never sure how I should say this. Schutel. It's weird, Schutel. It also feels like something where, you know, you're supposed to know how to say this, otherwise you're some kind of noob or something. I'm just gonna say Schutel. We're just gonna call it like that, Schutel. It helps you copy, move, archive, delete files and directories directly from Python. Here I have an example. I import Schutel and then I use it right here to copy a file, my pyproject.toml file, and I copy it to a backup. Or we can use make archive to create a zip archive. This is pretty helpful if you're dealing with, I don't know, managing files or doing automatic backups in a Python script or something, then using Schutel is really helpful. Let me run this. What has it done? Well, as you can see, there's now a backup by project file, which is a copy, and we have a zip file that VS Code can't read, unfortunately. There's probably an extension that can do that. Now I have a few more modules for you, and the last one is particularly powerful. But before I continue, if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to give the like and subscribe to my channel. This really helps my channel grow. It also helps me keep making deep dive videos like this one. Next up is text wrap, which helps you format text neatly. This is helpful if, for example, you're developing a CLI or you're printing logs or you're writing reports. And there's a couple of options here. So I'm importing text wrap in this example, I have some long text, but then what you can do is use textwrap.fill to make wrapped text. And you can also add indentation and you can also shorten it. It's just some examples. And with indentation, you can specify a prefix so that everything will be written behind that. And shorten allows you to specify a maximum width and then add a placeholder. So you can do uh, something like this, which is quite helpful in uh, longer texts. But let's run this and see what we got. There we go. Exactly what we wanted to have. Final module I want to mention is iter tools. This is incredibly powerful. It has a bunch of very efficient tools for looping, combining, processing data without loading everything into memory because it uses generators. Here are just a couple of examples of what you can do with iter tools module. Uh, combinations, for example, allows you to create all sorts of possible pairs from a list of items. I have items A, B, and C, and I'm going to generate all the combinations of two items, turn in a list, and it gives me all the pairs. As you can see, we have them right here. But there's more, there's also a counter, which can also be very helpful. You specify a starting point and a step, and then you just use next to retrieve the next counter value as many times as you want. And this is also what you see back in the output of the program. Another thing that's really helpful is that you can cycle through items. And this is something that happens quite a lot in like user interfaces where you need to like shift through different options. And then with cycle, you don't have to care about that the list has ended and you need to go back to the front. Cycle actually takes care of that. As you can see, I simply get my various cycles without having to worry about the list length. If I change this to, I don't know, let's say uh, 40, 
and around this again, we get 20 ons and 20 offs. Now, if you were doing this with a light switch, you would probably get a headache, but in Python, it's no problem. Other useful thing is GroupPy that clusters consecutive identical elements, which can be handy for data processing. So if you have this kind of list, for example, with A, Bs, and Cs, you can simply use group by to get a list of those things that you can see right here. Now, it's a tools has a bunch of other very useful generator functions as well. It's just a starting point. If you want to dive deeper into it's a tools and find out how it can help you in many cases, write much more concise code. Check out this video next. Thanks for watching and see you next time.